Hi everyone, I'm Matt Landis with NGDU and it's my pleasure to introduce Nadia Derikova. Um, in case you're not familiar with Nadia's work, she's probably, in, in addition to her day job as a user experience designer on local search, she's probably our number one expert on gamification and adding game, game mechanics into uh, software development. Um, when I had the pleasure to meet her a year ago, I was recruiting for what we call, eventually called the Game Design Advisory Board, which was a group of people who had actually worked in the industry to give advice to mostly internal teams and projects uh, and little Skunk Works projects. Eventually we got some external clients as well, including Google News, AdWords, um, and YouTube. Um, and that, a lot of that is due to uh, Nadia's existing long list of clients. So um, hopefully she'll give us this slide deck and take lots of notes because she's one of the best in the business. Thank you. Hello, thank you for coming. Um, we're gonna to talk today about how to design for user engagement. And this talk is a redo of a talk that they gave at South by Southwest this March. Here's a clue about how you should listen to this talk. We're gonna talk about a lot of design patterns, a lot of solutions, and you should be listening for the one solution that's applicable for your work. If you find one solution that you can go back to your desk and apply to your work so that your users are more engaged, you have won, you have been successful. That's what you should be listening for, one design pattern. So already, you already know about um, me from Matt's introduction. I work as a senior uh, game mechanic and user experience designer here at Google. And my background is in game design. I design for kids at LeapFrog and for all uh, ages for mobile, mobile games uh, for Backbone. I've done projects with MIT and I first started working on game mechanics at Razorfish, which is a digital agency. Well, since it's a fun topic, I want to start with a fun use case, a surprise. We're gonna visit a site called ICanHaseCheeseburger.com. Is that familiar? <laughs> All right, so this cat and dog are together and the cat says, I love my blanket. And then this cat says, I nap here at the same time every day, I think I'm in a rut. And this one says, sanity runs from my family. <laughs> and then just as I saw three of those, I got a pop-up that says, I have found the cheeseburger collectible. It's called Charts. And they say, log in to claim your collectible. Don't have an account, join today. So I go there, I set up my account, I, I create my first law, I didn't know how to do that before, but they've made it easy. And as soon as I submit my law, I get the trophy. They say, I made the funny and I can go see my badge. So I, can, I go see my badge and I see that I have made one of five different things that I could be doing. And if I keep going, I could eventually get a BA in Wallology. I, I also see that there's other people who've won this badge recently, so I see like a whole slew of people that I don't know that have been going through the similar processes as I have. And I see that I have trophies and collectibles and gifts, a whole tally board. So that's very interesting. Um, what has happened here is that this company, I can hash cheeseburger, which is already super engaging, it's one of the most popular sites on the web, has teamed up with Big Door in order to introduce game mechanics into their site and to reward their lawyer users. The result is that registrations has increased by 200% immediately after the launch of the trophies, and they have rewarded 63 million user actions, which were previously done by the users without any, any feedback, and they have given away 1.5 million trophies in the first four, four months. In other words, they have engaged their users. So what has happened here as well is that there's been a whole new language developed that didn't exist on the web about five years ago. We see trophies, we see um, burgers for rating, we have voting, we have sharing, we have pop-ups. All of these kind of game mechanics that we used to see more in games and not so much in web applications are now a new language that exists on the web. And this is what we're gonna tease apart today. We're gonna see how we can apply this to our, um, to our work um, in making applications. So let's take a, a moment and overview what's happening with game mechanics right now. Game mechanics are design patterns that promote play and play-like engagement. There's many definitions in the industry, that's mine. It works for me. Design patterns are repeatable solutions to design problems. So when you put them together, you kind of have Lego blocks. 
you, you have one block and another block, and then you make something unique. So this is how you should be using design patterns, by picking the ones that are applicable for you and that solve your problem and putting them together in novel ways. And remember, you're listening for the one game mechanic that will be useful for your project, or maybe more. There's a lot of companies that are using game mechanics for their work. Mint, Foursquare, Rocket, Recycle Bank, Epiquin, Chorewards, Nike Plus. There's even a company that's creating game mechanics into toothbrushes so that you can be more motivated to brush your teeth. Everything is getting gamified. There's a lot of thinkers that are writing about this field. There's people who are looking at it from the perspective of marketing and they say, this is the marketing of the new generation. Um, it's a lot more fun, it's, it's a new version of loyalty points. There's people like Jay, uh, Jane McGonigal that are looking at it from the perspective of, of using games to make life better in general, and her book Reality is Broken is a very interesting read on how to do that. Um, there's obviously people who are looking at it from the game design perspective and trying to expand the field, and a lot of um, writers, you know, such as the one that created the web reputation systems are look, already looking into how exactly to apply it to, to building social engagement. Um, there's even a conference about gamification, which is called the Gamification Summit, and they say that gamification is the new black. <laughs> um, a little bit of research. Um, most people use uh, game mechanics to promote user engagement. They can also be used for brand loyalty, brand awareness. These are the, ma the major goals. And most companies that are using game mechanics right now are in the stage of education. They're learning about it and they're gonna dip their toes in the water. There's fewer relatively that are completed, but we're gonna see more and more of that coming. The spending, the projected spending on game mechanics is also expected to increase, so this is going to be about a third of the social media marketing overall. It's a big number. With all of this attention to game mechanics, some people say there's game mechanics fatigue. These things are going to work for the first three months and that they're not going to be engaging, and then you're going to see it everywhere, and then it's not going to be fun anymore. So what I say to this is this is powerful stuff. It goes beyond budgets and, um, and, and simple kind of reward systems. It can, be, it can really tap into profound ways in which people think and which get, get motivated to do stuff. So the field is growing and we're only becoming more aware of the, of the power and the ways that we can apply these designs and new designs are growing. And again, it's so much more than points and badges, which is the first thing that people try when they start implementing game mechanics. So let's look into some design patterns. I'm gonna look at, at 16 overall. I created these um, when I was cons consulting with my clients. I realized that I always kind of run my mind through all the options. Okay, they have a problem and I'm trying to solve their problem to increase user engagement. What are kind of my tools? So I created a toolbox of these design patterns that I always think through. And I have, uh, uh, you know, spread these in three uh, separate aspects of the user journey. And the three separate things that we always want people to do. We want people to come and try our application. We want them to bring their friends. And then we want them to come back. Simple as that. So we're going to look at these three categories and how game mechanics work in these categories. So the first category is come and try it. Looking, you know, like you're very inviting application and it's easy for the users to understand what the rules are, what they're supposed to do, where they're supposed to click first. So the patterns that we're gonna discuss are visual storytelling, visual cues, tutorials, responsive objects, reward schedule, and disincentives. So one of my favorites and the simplest to introduce is visual storytelling. When you're playing a game, they're trying to have as little text there to introduce you to the rules as possible. You watch other players, you look at like iconified journeys, you look at cartoons, anything in order to make it easier for you to grog the rules. So for example, a Japanese game that I like called Rub Rabbits is using cartoon style introduction to every little mini game that they let you play. So they let you know what this is gonna be about. You're generally saving a girl here and you're trying to win her affection. So they're using these colorful cart cartoons to let you know these are the rules, this is what you're gonna be doing. So when you look at visual storytelling in websites, 
you see that it can also be applied. Groupon is letting you know that you have three things that you do, you get it, you share it, you enjoy it, and it looks like a, a pretty picture. And perhaps even better is like the four steps that, displays, that, that explain Zipcar. I mean, Zipcars were like a new, a new thing. People didn't know how they work. When you turn it into icons, when you break the user journey into something that's visual, it's so much faster for somebody to get it. And you really want that. You want people to grok what your application is about at the first glance, within the first second. Another thing that you can do in order to, now that you've gotten their attention, you explain what your app is about, you can use visual cues to direct the first click that you're going to get. With so many options and so many places to click, users are sometimes lost and they leave your site. You don't want a short visit. So how games do it is they very often have these big kind of giant yellow blinking arrows that say, click here. And then they walk you through a series of steps that you're supposed to do in order to understand what the application is about. This is from City of Immortals. Well, Facebook created a click here moment when they were introducing places uh, on mobile. They darkened the entire screen and just left a little kind of spotlight over the one application that they were trying to promote, the new application for places. Well, there was no choice, you had to click there. <laughs> they really got your attention. You may not always be able to get this uh, working on a on desktop, you can't always darken the entire screen. Um, but you can use like a brighter uh, color in order, in order to direct attention to things like did you know. So the entire Pandora application is blue, but for the did you know, like let me tell you about this feature app, they use yellow, so it's a little more you know, visible, and people can get a clue about what they're supposed to be looking at. Well, directing the attention can also happen in a very structured form, is what I call tutorial on Rails. A tutorial on Rails is basically like getting your, uh, to commit like five, six, seven steps that are, rec that are required and you're supposed to be driving through them as if you're on a little choo-choo train so that you can get from the point where you don't know anything about an application to the point where you kind of get it. So uh, Zynga is, is a fantastic example of the use of tutorials. They have studied every step, they've studied what works, you know, do you need an avatar, do you not need an avatar, how much text should be on the screen. So they have perfected what the tutorial entails so that you're not lost when, you, when you're looking at their games. Tutorials and onboarding on Rails exist in many applications. So Ribbon Hero is, for example, a game that teaches you about Microsoft Word. It breaks down all the different things you're supposed to know about Word from the simple to the deep into a game. Um, Get Glue is also interesting because before they let you explore the application at all, they make you rate um, 10 movies that, that you know of. And this is how you're learning about what you're gonna be doing later, which is after you get into Get Glue, and to create a taste profile. So you didn't have a whole lot of choice on the screen, you couldn't actually see what the application is, but you were doing the action that's gonna be core um, to your success in, the, in, in Get Glue afterwards. Um, another interesting pattern is the idea of responsive objects. So in games, everything is trying to create a big bang for your buck. Every touch is supposed to be a surprise. Um, for example, in this little game, when you touch the screen, the sun, the, the, the sun, you know, the sun rises. So you've caused literally with one touch, you've gone from day to, uh, from night to day. It's a big kind of bang for your buck. And game designers are always thinking, how can we apply our assets so we really get their attention? Explosions, flowers, fart sound effects, whatever is gonna work to get your users' attention, whatever is gonna give them options and make everything in this world respond to them and make them curious to explore. So, you know, you, 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 may, you may have simple and more complicated ways to do that. It's interesting that the web has moved from like a series of like pages that are all about text and maybe a couple of buttons to a space where you have really interactive objects. And examples of interactive objects are, for example, the login boxes in Tument. You enter your email and they say, okay, that box is listening to me. It's not only telling me when I'm wrong, it's kind of giving me thumbs up for the second step. So I know that I'm one step closer to, to logging and seeing you know, where my money is. Um, responsive objects are also the tweets. Um, by default, you only see one, one link into a tweet and as soon as you hover over it, you have so many more options. Now you can visit the user's profile, you can favor that retweet it and reply. This object responded to you. It, it looked simple and then it opened up a fan of, uh, of effects that you could be using. Um, another design pattern for initial user engagement is the idea of reward structure. 
Well, Cityville is really fun because there's always these coins and stars that you can connect. The screen is blingy and big. They, they're rewarding you for every single action. And there's a popular saying from Sid Meier, who is the game designer of Civilization, uh, who says that you cannot over reward the player in the first 10 minutes. You cannot make it too fun, you cannot make it too simple, you cannot make it too rewarding in the, in the beginning. So think about that. It. It's not gonna be the way we engage the users when they come back, but in the beginning, you really wanna remove all obstacles that you can and be as like, welcoming and rewarding as you can. So there are some applications that they're really good about making you feel good right away from the, from the get-go. Uh, Shopkick gives you six, 60 kick bucks just because you signed in. And Foursquare gives you a newbie badge just because you know you created your first check-in. That's great, like, it's not a big deal, but they make you feel good and they also introduce you to the idea that there'll be more badges later. IMVU gives you points for trying new things on your avatar, which is crucial in looking good in, in a world um, that has like all these chat systems and where your avatar really matters. So, again, like, the over-rewarding is good for beginners, but you actually want to challenge the experts. So you, you have some badges in Foursquare that are easy to achieve and some that are really hard. And incidentally, a lot of people are asking like, oh, was it so clever that Foursquare didn't tell you how you achieved the missions? And so you had to go on the web and like, you know, Google how you like unlock the socialite badge. Actually, it wasn't by design. They just didn't have enough time to implement like the tips about how you unlock the badges. But it turned into a kind of a puzzle hunt because people were then trying to like get these badges that they're hard to get and writing blogs about them. And so they create additional engagement just by this kind of fun process of discovery. Um, another example of challenging the experts is uh, the achievements in Plants vs. Zombies. Um, how many of you have unlocked the multiculturalist badge in Plants vs. Zombies? One. I, you have to tell me how you do it, because like, I played that game so many times to unlock that one last achievement and I couldn't, but that made me much more interested because there was something hard there that they're dangling in front of me. And how many of you play Plants vs. Zombies? Okay. Well, now you need, you need to try the multiculturalist badge. Let me know if you manage. <laughs> Okay, so this was about the rewards, but how do we, what do we do with disincentives? Because games have disincentives for sure, right? Like, you can die, even in a Pac-Man game. <laughs> That's a serious disincentive. Um, you can use them. There's, the, there's interesting things to do. Stick is an application that helps you achieve your goals by signing up for negative rewards. So you say, like, if I don't lose weight, I'm gonna have to contribute money to the abortion <laughs> clinic. <laughs> <laughs> of America, or I have to contribute to gun control or something like that. So can you, we kind of make it fun, you know? It's not what you want to have happen. It's a disincentive of sorts, but they've turned it around. <laughs> I'm glad you guys like that. Um, Grokit is one of my favorite startups uh, applying game mechanics, and they're really cool because they're actually tracking every step of the way. They have like a, a, a super PhD quantitative wizard who is helping them analyze all their A-B tests and how users are behaving. So one thing that they learn is that negative points, like Grokit is a site where you do test prep, like TOEFL, SAT, LSAT, all these things that really aren't fun, but they create a community to make it more, uh, more interesting. So. First, they started by giving users negative points if they get the answer wrong. But then they found that if you do an A-B test with people who are getting minus points versus those that are not, those that are getting the minus points are not sticking around so much. They feel like maybe they've been punished, they feel like maybe it's too hard, so they're not sticking around. So they, they went from minus, minus half a point to minus a quarter of a point, like reducing the disincentive, and still compared to those people who weren't getting negative rewards. They were still like, not getting the users as engaged as they would be without negative points. So that's something that they're considering going away with. Those users weren't ready for that. Maybe at the more advanced level, but like, as soon as they were starting the application, it didn't really work for them. So in summary, how do you say to your users, come and try it? You can try a bunch of patterns. You can try visual storytelling, which uses icons, cartoons, uh, visual, visual kind of storytelling, visual cues, which kind of points them here, click here. Um, you can use tutorials, responsive objects, a good reward schedule that really is like ramped up in the beginning, get harder afterwards, and then you can apply disincentives carefully. 
the next subject is how you create something inherently social. How do you tell users to bring your friends? So we're gonna review a few of the many options. We're gonna look at what it means to have a gated trial to uh, give opportunities for social feedback, a reputation system, sharing milestones, and my favorite, which is mischief. A gated trial is kind of like in dodgeball where you need to form a team before you can even access the game. Um, you probably remember all these Facebook applications that require you to send the email to 10 of you ten of your Facebook friends before you can even get into the application. Well, it's a bad user experience, but it's actually a fantastic way for them to become viral. And um, it's actually the, the statistic that kind of the industry has agreed upon is that if users have five friends, like for example, I heard this from Gowala, I heard this from the Facebook news feed. If the users have five friends, they're much more likely to become return users. And the way we interpret that finding is that Users are getting, um, first of all, their friends are explaining what the game is. They would explain Goala much better than any kind of like an a, attempt that we can do as designers. And the friends are helping them debug it. So if something is not working, your friends will be your technical support. And also, your friends create the content and the real reason to come back. So um, having, having like a community to begin with is very important. It creates engagement. Um, this is part of the reason why a lot of um, startups are using Facebook Connect so that you're coming with your community as soon as you stand through the door. And it's interesting because these first kind of initial few moments are so important to get right that in a redesign, Twitter increased the number of screens that they got into application only to make sure that people were following more people um, on, on Twitter. So they, they wanted to introduce you to more follower, to, to more people to follow, more people who are creating content from the get-go. And that was more important than the friction that's introduced by having my, many screens. Um, these are some of the objects, like uh, the art design and books and, and themes that they suggest for you to follow. Another interesting pattern is the idea of social feedback. So um, social feedback is like the quick kind of interactions that users uh, can do um, to, to play with each other. So for example, um, I play Cityville and my friend John plays Cityville in London. We're not playing it at the same time, we're playing asynchronously. Uh, John pushes the button and he helps me out and then when I log in, I see that he's helped me, and then I push another button, and I help him out. So this kind of like a social cooperation has been reduced to verbs and to buttons that the users can push to interact with each other and feel the real, the real emotions that you do get if your friend helped you. Um, how do you do this in a social application? My favorite um, is the thank you button. So Advark, which is one of the companies that Google acquired, um, he has a thank you button built into the interaction between users. The, it's a site where you ask questions and people, people answer them for you. And so to complete the conversation, to be polite, but also to re-engage the person who answered your question, you push thank you, they get an email and they say somebody, somebody, really, liked your, um, somebody really liked your reply. That feels good, it's very quick. I didn't have to type in anything. Uh, the thank you button is becoming more popular because I saw after Advark, I saw Quora using it in their reply. So it's one of the options. Um, you can go a step further than just a simple button and do like a selection of buttons for structuring their feedback and then some space to write, which is what Yelp does for the users. So the reason why this is powerful is that, as you know, like a lot of social boards, like they can be a source of mischief. People can be saying bad things. But if you say like, this is the compliment button, and then you're giving them like 10 versions of what they could say in terms of compliment. You're directing their thoughts so much towards the positive behavior that I do believe that it, they're more likely to be complimentary and nice and polite. You've kind of set the stage for that. And you've also given them a lot of options, kind of helping them along what they could be doing. Um, another way to give social feedback, but in a public way, is through the voting um, and the liking mechanisms. So a vote and a like is not something that you just give to one person, it's something that you say to the entire community, so now your friends are paying attention to that post um, that you voted for. Reputation um, is what happens when you get the points and the, the behaviors create, created from all the social feedback that you've created and all the user gen gen generated com content. Um, you, can have, you can treat the reputation in different ways. You can keep it to yourself. So you're scoring your users, but you're not telling them. And this helps you know 
who are your most engaged users? If you had a promotional campaign and you couldn't give it to everyone, you should be giving it to your most engaged users. So it's important to know. That's how you can use reputation without telling them. Or you can tell users um, you have a high reputation and then they'll be, they have a different standing in the community. So reputation, simple, you know, in, in Cityville you have like different stats that you're achieving and that's visible to everyone. And in the real world, um, or in the world of eBay, for example, you have a top rated seller. It's a much safer bet to buy something from that seller um, as opposed to somebody who doesn't have it. Uh, one up me is a forum that uses like the idea of a top voter that's also something that's used in other sites so as soon as somebody gets a lot of points that you calculate behind the screen for their votes you give them a top voter badge which is displayed for everyone and also gives more weight to their vote so that becomes a, a way for them to kind of really weigh in their opinion sharing achievements uh, is another way that you can engage users socially so Xbox Live is a great example of how you share your achievements. It's a community around your gaming stuff. How many of you play the Xbox? Okay, good. So sharing achievements, I'm sure you, you know, like that happens on, on Twitter when Foursquare badges get unlocked. You probably remember when your friends were playing Farmville in the beginning and all of your feed on Facebook was getting spammed. Um, it's kind of like a double-edged sword because you learn about this, this thing that your friends are doing, but you know, that game or that application can also burn out their channel. And so eventually the game stuff was banished to its own channel um, so that it's not polluting your screen. It's always kind of tricky because maybe only 5% of the users will use the sharing and only like 5% of the friends will come back. So is that good enough for the 95% who got spammed? I mean, a lot of companies are saying yes to that, but there's kind of like a decision of that, that you have to do versus spamming versus getting more users. And we got to my favorite part, which is mischief. So um, I don't know if you remember, but on April 1st, uh, you could uh, TP the farm of one of your friends in Farmville. It was easy to achieve. I don't know if any of, any of your friends um, TP'd you, but um, it was a fun way to direct the negative energy that inevitably arises when you have a community. So um, mischief is like really well used in chat roulette. How many of you know how they make money? You do? Uh, when says it negative, they're directed to like That's it. <laughs> so Roulette is a video site where you get matched at random with somebody who's gonna be a chat buddy. Um, there's some mischief there, you know, some people are not as appropriate as they should be. And if you get flagged multiple times, you get redirected to a porn site and they, they, they basically, you know, collect the change. <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can see why I like this. Um, so in summary, we talked about a few things. You can gate the trial for your users and require for them to form a team to start. You can allow ways to create social feedback which are really powerful mechanisms by simplifying it to uh, simplifying the user interaction between two users um, to a verb and making a button out of it um, or creating multiple choices like in the Yelp complement system. Creating reputations that you share or you not share with your users. Um, sharing milestones and then mischief. All right, so the last uh, portion of the talk is about how you create return engagement. And sometimes that can be very difficult. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, sites launch and then they don't see the users come back or only, you know, 5% of the users come back. And like, is this good enough? Is this not good enough? Well, regardless of how you feel about your return numbers, you always know that you want to increase them. So we're going to talk about some ways to do that. So we're going to talk about advanced user paths, content unlocks, quest queue, time pressure, and scarcity. Advanced paths are somewhat like you have on a mountain. So you have the same mountain, but people with different skills are sharing it. You have the black diamonds, and then you have the bunny slope. The experience is very different. So when you're designing an application, you kind of need to think about it like that. What are the different kind of user behaviors and types of users that they have? And how do you create a different experience for them based on how different their behavior is? So Yelp has a good example of, a, of a different user roles. Like if you're just a regular user of Yelp, which is probably the majority, 
you're mostly spending time at the search results page. So that page is, op is optimized for that kind of consumption. If you're in the lead squad, there's a portion of the site that you care more about, which involves your profile, it involves you know, the community events that are happening around it, the communication that you have around that. So you have two different experiences of the site, and you're not necessarily spending time at the same site. So it's optimized differently for those two different types of users. Um, another example of advanced uh, you know, user paths is the idea that you can achieve something if you keep going. So in the beginning, you're going to be engaged in getting badges on Foursquare. And if you keep going, you eventually become the mayor. So there's something that's dangled in front of you. I had an interesting case where I really wanted to become the mayor of my favorite brunch place in Noi Valley. And it turned out that the waitress is the mayor. <laughs> So it's really hard to be her, but I kept going. I spent a lot of money and a lot of my friends to come to this brunch place, and eventually I beat the waitress, and everybody in the restaurant knew it. So this advanced user path option that they created for me worked out. It worked out for the restaurant, and it worked out for me because I got something out of achieving mayorship. So uh, content unlocks is another design pattern to engage for, for getting users to come back. How many of you play Angry Birds? Yes, all right. The rest of you should get it, because I'm sure you heard about it. Um, where you start and you know, unlock some levels, but as soon as you unlock level you know, one and two, even start playing, you see that there's like a gazillion more levels to unlock and more screens that are coming with more content. So you know that what you're playing now is just the tip of the iceberg. There's a lot more coming for you. But you can't actually see what these levels are. So you need to keep like, you know, even if you're a really good player, you have to play through all the beginning levels to get to the in, you know, to the harder level. So content unlocks in this case work. So this is a, a model that's going to be uh, showing a different dress every day of the month. And so they start with day one, and she's wearing this dress, and then they have her silhouette cut out for day two, day three, day four. They're, they're letting you know there's more coming. She's going to show you more dresses, but it's not obvious, you know, what these look like. So you better come back tomorrow. Quest queue is very interesting, and in games it's used to queue up optional things that you could do to make your game experience more fun. So for example, I really like zombie farms. It's a natural, if you finish Plants vs. Zombies, zombie farm is really fun afterwards. Um, they let you know that if you plant, you know, you, you can c complete a mission by planting a special kind of zombie, um, by, you know, collecting a special kind of gift, by raising a special kind of species. And so they've queued them on the left side, side of the application. There's a bunch of things that you could be doing. Don't have to. We're not going to stop your gameplay for that. But it's a fun, fun thing that you could try. So quest queues. A lot of people talk about the progress meter in LinkedIn, but what's even more interesting is how they turn it into a quest queue. So you have to add a position, add your education, add a picture, all of these kind of things that they really need to get you to do um, in order for the site to work. And like working on a resume, it's not fun. So if you can like break it into quest queues, that makes it more powerful. You can use the same idea in your application. If there's many steps these user should be doing or could be doing, you can suggest them like that. Um, I also like Epiquin, it's kind of like a time management device where you're the one setting your own quest queues. You're choosing what you want to engage in. So for example, um, when I was working on my lecture, I created a quest queue for me to basically analyze the low cats, which we started with, and I said it's going to be 200 points and it's going to be a feat of social. And then like, I completed it and then I checked it off my list. So I'm setting my own quest queues and that was an interesting way for me to engage um, with, with my time management. And speaking of time, time pressure is like probably one of the oldest game mechanics that anybody has tried. So you know the chess can become a lot more fun and an expert player with added you know, time, time pressure has a whole set of different set of constraints which is also super, super engaging. So time pressure is fun to try like on a site like Swoopo. <laughs> so I'm, I'm sure you guys know about Swoopo, right? Like, you have time pressure to bid on objects, bid a dollar, and you can get a Louis Vuitton bag or win a laptop. Um, eBay also has time pressure because you're doing you know, like a, a, a public auction. And there's only one second left, so you better be bidding now. I'm sure there's at least a few of you who have been there you know, late at night <laughs> waiting for your auction to, um, to come you know, so that you can be doing your, um, getting your rewards. Uh, scarcity is another one of those kind of older but also super interesting game mechanics. And it can be used um, when you have a whole bunch of options if you make some of them rare. Like for example, in um, 
in, in, the, in, the, in the Zynga game, they have a lot of features that you can be engaging, but they, say, they make some of them VIP. And maybe they even have a tier system where you, you know, there's three types of VIP fishes, one, two, and three, and the three is super hard to get, and so you're gonna add some people that will be playing really hard to get that object, which is really scarce, because it says something about them, that they have achieved this, and that they, they have the pride in their community of having done this um, scarce object. So a favorite example of, of the use of scarcity is the million dollar homepage which is um, a student in Britain wanted to raise a million dollars, great idea, he wanted it for, the, for his education, and he created a website uh, with a million pixels and sold each of them for a dollar. So a company could pay a dollar, put their logo on. He made a million dollars, how about it? Scarcity is also um, used you know, in, in lightways, uh, lightweight um, application in Hotpot, which is uh, Google's social rating um, Side. Uh, so we were we were finding the team at Hotpot were finding that five stars really doesn't get you like the best distribution always. A lot of places end up getting rated about four stars, and then you can't really distinguish and compare them. So we added the six star, uh, the best ever, and you only get ten best ever's, which means you have to like think about this. You're rating over time, you know. I've used up my best ever on this place, but I have this new favorite, and then you have to switch them around. <coughs> and for your friends, the best ever is a great signal that you really, really are recommending this place. So it played a valuable role in the community by the fact that it's scarce. In summary, we reviewed five things for getting users to come back. Thinking about different paths for the beginners and the advanced users, and however else you can segment your user behavior. Um, creating content and locks, so they know there's more to do over time. Creating quest queues, so you suggest ways in which they could be engaging with your application. And time pressure and scarcity, which are tried and true, not appropriate everywhere, but again, you're listening for the one that could be helping you. Did you find one that could be helping your designs? I take the silences and yes. And if you, if you have more questions, you can talk to me after. So the beauty of game mechanics is that they're measurable behaviors. That's part of the reason why I'm in this game, because it's really fun to have a hypothesis and then test it out with users, do an A-B test, collect the data. If you, if you haven't, if, 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 you, if this is the first time you're doing an A-B test, you can be collecting the data uh, without the game mechanic that you're doing, then launch the game mechanic to a part of the population and then see what happens. And it's amazing to see return on kind of like your design hypothesis. You can make it better. So good news, it's measurable. Um, it, you have to be prepared to measure and iterate because it's not, you're not always going to get the behaviors that you're expecting for. Again, like Grocket, when they had the negative points, they thought that's going to make it more fun and retain the users, but it was doing the opposite. So you have to be prepared. If you're measuring something, you also have to iterate. And then um, that each, each pattern and each stage of the user engagement has unique metrics that, that can be applied to it. One site and one company that I think is great for metrics, and I, I really enjoy talking to them because, um, because they, they have a, a, a dashboard of metrics for game mechanics is Bungeball. Um, I don't know if you've recently been to the lecture that they, that they gave at Google, but um, they're basically creating a dashboard behind the game mechanics that they're applying for their customers. So in this view, you're tracking the total number of users, the, the, the new users, and the active users. In the next view, you're seeing the top game mechanics that were introduced in the site, um, like winning a trophy, um, sending you know, a daily bonus to your friends, watching a video, whatever they were tracking, it's introduced as behavior, and then you're seeing, is it going up or is it going down? And in the cases where it's going down, there's things that you can do about it. So for example, Bunchball was working on the virtual housewife throwdown, which is like a site supporting a Bravo, a, fa a, a famous uh, TV show. So they're seeing that users are really not giving gifts to each other because they could see it on their dashboard and that, that was important for them to re-engage the community. So they created a pop-up that said, oh, remember that you can give gifts to your friends. And then they saw the behavior went up. It's very rewarding. It, it gives you a sense of control and if you, it gives you a sense that you can achieve the things that you've set out to do with your users. So in summary, game mechanics are so much more than points and badges. There, there are a growing list of patterns, the industry is getting creative, and we're all making more of them, we're all adding to them as we're experimenting and measuring and iterating. These are the, the ones that I frequently think about, but you're probably discovering your own. And um, you can, you know, always, you know, 
as you as you're discovering things, think about what are you trying to solve. Are you trying to create initial engagement to bring friends or to get users to come back? Because then you know what you're going to be tracking. And um, at the end, I want to thank the companies that uh, let me interview them in order to prepare for this talk. I talked to startups like Grocket and Goala, uh, Clubsite, which is um, a, a TV show that uses game mechanics, OneUpMe, M2 Research, Punchbowl, Big Door, Zynga, Advark, and Slide. All right, and that's all, folks. <laughs>